Hello and welcome to our presentation for the project Tennis 3D for the course Smart Sensing for IoT. These are the team members for the project. We'll be discussing the abstract, introduction, system design, applications, future scope and conclusion. Starting with the abstract. The project entails implementing a gesture recognition approach to detect different types of tennis strokes and then using the data to play a real-time game on their PC. To play this game, the player must utilize their Android smartphone as a tennis racket and a mobile app to wirelessly upload the IMU sensor data gathered while playing the strokes to the PC. The data is received in real time by the game and the shots are played, by, played in the game corresponding to the shots fired through this user's smartphone. To determine the player's location in the court, we developed a computer vision model within the game that depicts the players, that which detects the player's locations uh, based on the player's face position in the camera. The primary goal of the project is to create a low cost alternative to expensive consoles that execute comparable con concepts at a greater cost. Moving on, the motivation behind the project. So this project began with the goal of creating a low-cost alternative to virtual reality controllers as existing devices such as Oculus Rift are highly costly and out of the reach of majority of gaming enthusiasts. We quickly recognized, however, that implementing such solutions using readily available hardware would be difficult since the technology necessary to identify the precise location of the hands is quite sophisticated. So we decided to create a PC game that only uses the linear and angular acceleration data as input. The course also helped us envision solutions through introducing uh, smart sensing concepts and examples. As a result, we decided to make a PC tennis game that, that has a final output similar to the tennis games that can be played on consoles like Xbox Kinect and PS3 Move. The idea of playing a game on screen while physically interacting with it through your body motions is not new. As previously said, platforms such as Nintendo Wii, Xbox Kinect, and PS3 Move have been producing similar results uh, in their games for quite some time. However, in these circumstances, specific hardware is required, which was costly and could not be further utilized for anything beyond gaming. Another product which aims at bringing a cheap alternative to VR headsets is the VR Glove. There is a need for efficient and affordable ways to input gestures and navigations in everyday devices like PCs, and there is a market need for it and we can identify the gap and uh, input solutions can be improved using these metrics when considered. Moving on to the system design. So I'll briefly explain the workflow. First, we take the IMU accelerometer and gyroscope data from the phone and transfer it to the PC via a UDP protocol. The user has to connect their PC and smartphone to the same Wi-Fi for this to be possible. The user has to select the appropriate options in the Hyper IMU app and select a a port number, anything between 5,000 and 6,000 works, and set the sampling rate to 50. Then the user has to run the server.py with UTP IP set to IP address version 4 of the PC, and the UP, UTP port set as the same port the user entered in the hyper -AMU application. Then the user can run the server.py code and start streaming data from the phone. To ensure the data is streaming, the user should see an output of NA0 at uh, one second interval if the phone is at rest. Wish I would now take over to explain server.py. Now let's discuss the server.io. So basically the main file in this is the server.py file, which incorporates the bulk of the processing, be it the computer vision model or the machine learning model for the IMU data. So here we have two processes running independently, not parallelly, I suppose, but independently in the sense we one on one hand we have the we have the input data of the of the hyper IMU app from the phone, uh, which is then processed through our ML model, and we have a prediction for a particular shot played and the power at which the shot was played. Simultaneously, we are also using the webcam feed to detect the player position using the dimensions of the face uh, and the relative position to the screen. For the ML model, we have used uh, our own uh, training data set, uh, which will be obviously discussed later. Also, for the computer vision model, computer vision model, we use, we predict the we predict the position in two dimensions, one for the depth, in the sense of depth of the code with respect to the code, whether it's towards the net or away from the net, and the other is a lateral coordinate with respect to whether it's left to the code or right of the code. So uh, coming to it, it's basically the main aspect is, is that this is the bulk, this is where the bulk processing is being done. This is where the culmination of the ML project, ML, pro, uh, ML aspect, as well as the OpenCV aspect, as well as the sockets, even uh, the network aspect, that is for the UDP sockets that we use, be it from the IMU app to our main server.py file, or be it from, or be it from a server.py file to the Unity, C hash, uh, Unity C sharp uh, uh, socket that you use, Unity C sharp client that we use basically. Uh, hi, so I'll be speaking about the IMU sensing and the machine learning aspects of the of the project. And in this project, the main purpose of the IMU sensor was to detect the kind of shot the user has played and uh, uh, and map the appropriate movements of the uh, map the appropriate measurements of the accelerometer and the gyroscope. And along with that, uh, we needed a machine learning model to train uh, to train the collected data and predict what the user has played in real time. And, so for recording, as Pranish has already said, we have used the hyper annual application, which transmits the data in real time to a PC. Uh, so yeah, so for the, for the types of shots, we decided to go ahead with four types of shots, as we believe that this is a good beginning for a project like this, and we can easily classify the uh, user movements into four types. So as mentioned over here, these are the four kinds of shots that we have uh, tried to map on uh, in our data. Uh, these are some of the these are some of the movements that uh, are associated with these kinds of shots. Uh, as you can see, forehand topspin, forehand backspin, 
backhand topspin and backhand backspin. Uh, yeah, so for each of these, this, uh, these are the uh, uh, these are the measured uh, accelerometer and gyroscope readings. So as you can see that uh, for each of these shots, uh, for each of these shots, the uh, readings are somewhat different, and therefore it is quite easy to map uh, what kind of sensing, uh, what kind of measurement was taken, and to what kind of shot was played. And so, yeah, for, these were the observations that we made. Uh, we made. Uh, also, most of the uh, phone, the IMU sensors in the phones have a maximum acceleration limit of around 78 to 80 meters per second square, which uh, which was maxed out in some of our readings as well. And so, so we decided to, yeah. In so in the machine learning aspect, we collected the data, which was around 40 iterations of each shot, and trained uh, trained uh, and measured the uh, like these scatter plots were obtained from that data. So we can see that the they, they, again they are they are quite different for each of the type of uh, shots that were played. And yeah, so for the machine learning module, we decided to implement a very simple random forest classifier because uh, this was very uh, quick to predict the outcome in real time, and we were getting a very high Matthews correlation coefficient score with a decent enough test size of our data. And for the feature vector uh, for the feature vector part of our model, we decided to implement only five values, which were A Y A Z G X G Y and G Z. This is because A X was getting maxed out in most of our readings, and uh, we also noticed that A X was denoting the amount of power that the user has applied while playing the shot. So yeah, now over to Chinmay to describe Unity. Uh, thank you, Abhimanyu. Uh, now I'll talk about the application of uh, the IMU sensing that Abhimanyu discussed. So for the application, we de decided to develop a Unity game. So we decided to use Unity 3D Game Engine because it's handy to develop a physics-based game. Right. So the game itself has four major components. So there's walls, there's the net, there's the ground, and then there's the ball, there's the bot, and there's the player. So the first component uh, are the static objects, which includes walls, net, and the ground, uh, which is useful in, in determining uh, whether the player or the bot gets the point. Then the next component is the ball. The ball itself has two major properties. First is the upward force, and the second is the forward thrust. So this is useful in determining where the ball will go and with what force. So the upward force uh, determines how upwards it will go as uh, as it is self-explanatory. And the forward thrust determines with how much power the ball will go forward. Then there's a bot. The bot itself is a pretty simple artificial intelligence, which tracks the uh, Z direction uh, movement of the ball and accordingly adjusts itself to play the shot. And as per the player, which is the most important component of this game, we provide the input via our phones and later OpenCV also. So I'll talk about how we exactly take the input. So for the input, we decided to develop a C Sharp UDP client. So as you can see here, it listens to uh, any IP address that we have provided. So for this project, uh, the IP address is the home address itself, since we assume that the Pi server and the game will be played on the same machine. So it uh, receives the data in the form of a string, which has comma separated values in it. Uh, the first value tells the type of the gesture. The second value tells the power of the shot. The third value tells about the swing direction. And the last two values tell about the horizontal and vertical movement uh, obtained from the OpenCV algorithm. So the next is swing direction, which is important, which is also an important part of sensing uh, the type of the shot played. So for swing direction, we primarily are in interested in three major directions. So the uh, first is the center direction, which is directly across the net. And the other two are the cross-court shots, which could be towards the left or the right. So we want to measure the swing direction using the IMU data. So how do we do that? So for that, we basically were interested more in the gyroscope data because that's the intuitive approach, all right? So we plotted the gyroscope data for forward and backward swings. And as you can see, for forward swings, uh, the so here the red and blue uh, graphs are respectively for gyroscopes data around the x-axis and y-axis. So as you can see, uh, and the green graph is for the gyroscope data around the z-axis. So as you can see, uh, the gz axis, so gyroscope data around the z-axis, isn't really helpful because it's more or less just white noise. Uh, but for the x and y direction, we get something useful that we can use here. Right? So as you can see, uh, for forward swings, the x and y data peak in the positive direction. And for the backward swings, they peak in the negative direction. So this is one takeaway from the data. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of high frequency noise, which could be filtered out with whatever filter as uh, we used in the first assignment also. So we use that filter and we filter our data to get a better looking uh, peaks. Right? So as you can see, the first two graphs are for the forward and backward strokes with more swing and spin. So we can infer from these uh, graphs that higher the amplitude of the peak is and the wider it is, the more is the swing. And the swing relates to the gyroscope data around the x-axis, while the spin relates to the gyroscope data about the y-axis. And similarly, the bottom two graphs are for forward and backward strokes with less swing and spin. So as you can see, uh, the narrower the peak is and the less the amplitude is, the uh, less is the swing and spin, respectively. So we could use this data to determine the swing direction and also how larger is the angular displacement with, that comes with it. Right? So as Abhimanyu described earlier, 
we are using accelerometers x direction data as a threshold right so if it's uh, if it's above a certain threshold it will register it as a gesture so once the player starts the gesture which we can uh, know by looking at the ax data which is the accelerometer data in x direction we can know that the gesture has started and then we can look at the gx data which is the gyroscope data around the x axis to know the direction and the amplitude of the angular displacement which can be obtained from here directly one more method would be to look at the accelerometer data in z direction which gives more reliable uh, input but for that we'll need to track a time series data and it may or may not be as uh, spontaneous and since we are more interested in getting real time uh, response we are okay with a, a little degree of error so as you can see for the acceler accelerometer z data for forward strokes there are two peaks but the first peak is the positive peak and the second peak is the negative peak as you can see here and for the backward it's the opposite so the first is the negative peak and the next is the positive peak so if we basically show this time series data we can for sure say uh, what's the direction of the swing but we decided to go with the gyroscope data around the x axis since we are, we anyway were taking a threshold for accelerometer x data so that was quicker right so this is uh, basically the code snippet for the implementation of the same so we basically pass the gx threshold uh, we basically pass the gx data and if it's above a certain threshold we basically go with uh, more towards the forward swing if it's below a negative threshold we go more towards with the back backward swing and if it's between the two thresholds we go with a center shot and that was it for the uh, unity implementation moving on uh, vishal will talk more about the open cv implementation uh, which we use for the movement uh, input thank you following from chinmay on the calculation of what shot to play we now move to the open cv aspect which covers from where the shot is played right or where the player needs to go and for that we just implement a very simple computer vision model and using the computer webcam as our input feed to detect the player position on basically two coordinates one the depth coordinate and another is the lateral coordinate for the detection algorithm we are using the hard cascades classifier hard cascades classifier is a real time phase detection model that we use in our application the main aspect the main, obviously a lot of better models are there but for the real time aspect of the game right this is the critical uh, model that we found to be very good now not not going too much into the deep theory of uh, what makes a hard cascade classifier that good uh, i cover the key points which are first of all the hard features what are hard features which are essentially pixel intensity calculations for adjacent rectangular regions which is nothing but a very basic uh, basic uh, building block of detecting objects whether or not something is a part of an object or not following that we have the integral images which is nothing but a, which is a technique that we use because if uh, that we use to reduce the computation in the sense that if we if we find try to find out the hard features on all of the pixels this will be quite difficult so what we do is divide the uh, divide the image or the frame into quite uh, into a lot of rectangular small rectangular blocks and then apply the same hard features on that following that we have eta boost or boosting in general where we combine the weak classifiers into stronger classifiers because each weak classifier kind of just uh, determines whether or not something is part of an object and collectively we are able to actually detect some certain objects also the bagging and boosting techniques are not that uh, not that expensive so that also helps in keeping the uh, execution time low for the prediction following this we come to the main task which is actually determining where the player is right and for that as we discussed we had two coordinates lateral and depth for the lateral coordinate we used the webcam's width itself as the limits and the, and the faces center relative to those limits is then used as a as a lateral uh, coordinate in the sense whether it's towards the left or towards the right and obviously if it's towards the left it's with a minus coefficient uh, with a minus minus integral or uh, it's positive it's towards, uh, it's towards the right similarly for the depth calculation we have we take the size we take the dimensions of the face and then calculate it corresponding to a threshold that we have we have seen that uh, it is a linear uh, growth as uh, linear growth of the face dimensions with the coming closer to the camera so basically we are able to easily get a model in the sense that we we can set some certain weights and we easily get what uh, what the depth coefficient or whether the depth coordinate that we need to get given uh, accordingly for the lateral movement we have it between minus 5 and plus 5 integral values and for the depth coordinate we have it between minus 2 and 2 and this is personally because this has been chosen because uh, this kind of captures the whole range of motion of the player on the field following that we do go through this code snippets so we see that we are actually using the hard cascades frontal face default which is also present in by the way the open cv master data and hard cascades in the github repository now and we use the .xml file to load the model and and subsequently use it for uh, for uh, face detection here we actually have some real uh, we have some screenshots from the image feed that we got and you can see as in the as you can see in the leftmost pictures both on the top and the bottom you can see that the first coordinate is kind of the same which kind of depicts that okay it's uh, it's in the particular uh, left side it, it's towards the particular left side of the camera but uh, the as you can see the second coordinate which kind of determines the depth as you can see two is closer and zero means it's farther and similarly in the central picture you can see that it's 3,2 which is like okay it's quite close and it's also quite right for the third picture in the frame we see that it's 0,0 which is kind of our mean that we set in this case uh, for the thresholds being uh, according to abhimanyu as you can see in the picture 
Following this, we have the future scope and conclusion, where we actually see what on, on what points we can actually improve upon. First being the IMU sensing and machine learning aspect. From that, from in that aspect, we think that uh, making the model more robust is uh, is one of the obvious improvements that we can do. Because even for four people in our group, we were we were always getting kind of uh, kind of biased uh, classifiers for us. So if we have a vast data set, a larger data set with, a, with maybe even more short selections to be made, it's going to make a lot of it's it's going to make it's going to make the consistency better for the model. And also, uh, we can even add the threshold detections part that we have kind of hard coded in this. In this uh, in this project, to be kind of to be selected from the unsupervised learning mechanisms while training itself, like while we are actually loading the game, it's able to actually calculate the thresholds using a few trial runs, right? And we can use the unsupervised learning aspect from on that. Following, we have the Unity aspect, on which I think we all can agree that we could have added more animations in that. Also, uh, the bot intelligence can be or the bot difficulty level can also be set. I think that's another good aspect to add. But uh, something core to the course or the, the concepts in the course would be to add synchronization between the between the webcam uh, input or the or the location derivation location detection that we got and the and the IMU sensing aspect, which is like what shot to play. And if we are able to synchronize it better and get the latency low, we can actually have a real life experience of maybe how we play a tennis shot, right? Following that, we have the improvements in OpenCV, which is to be honest, the bulk of the improvements we suggest because as we know, uh, as even in our project, we have mentioned that uh, we have mentioned two builds, one with uh, one uh, which is without OpenCV and one with OpenCV. Uh, and the prop and the fact and we the prop and the fact that we provide these two builds is because we want you to be we want you to appreciate the IMU aspect on the short aspect irrespective of the of the of the movement of the player, right? So that kind of highlights that the stable build and with the OpenCV build, we are trying to make it more realistic. And for the OpenCV build, we obviously have some we have certain uh, improvements that we suggest. One is to make the model more robust. I think that's a theme that continues. So uh, we were we were actually facing a bit of issues in the sense of uh, selecting the face or detecting the face in motion, and even uh, if it's a bit too tilted, right? And for that, we suggest uh, because we don't want to rotate it and uh, do more computation on it because that is going to take away the real-time aspect of it. So we we have to develop a bit more uh, precise model for this kind of application. Also, another aspect to add is the computer vision improvement in the sense of uh, in, of the input being a skewed image, right? In the sense, we, uh, the webcam is not exactly in the center of the field, and we need to still be able to get the full range of motion possibly. So that aspect has also may also need to be added. Uh, another thing to add, which I think is personally a bit uh, too difficult, but I still thought it was going to be interesting, was to add object detection, particularly for eyes, upper body, and lower body, and give this information to the adversarial player, right? So that even their actions are more human-like in some sense. It's actually a computer competing against you. So that, like, definitely, I think that would add up. But I think that's a difficult task to achieve, as of now. In conclusion, we set out with the goal to develop an economic alternative, and I and I think we pretty much did it with using our phone and a couple of couple of lines of code. To be honest, uh, obviously, there's a lot more to be explored and uh, develop, and even but even for this game that was developed only in a couple, course of a few weeks, where we had to learn and uh, develop all of these things, uh, we still were able to do a pretty good job. And definitely, if we give a little bit more time and dedication, this would have been even better. In the end, we would just like to thank Sir for giving us this opportunity and also for the extension to 23rd of November. Thank you, Sir.